Ed. Hello, Mr. John Mark. How are you? And Jim Martell and Nicole Young and Annette Briggs. How are all of you? Great. Rock and rolling, rock and rolling. Talking about the, uh, talking about the beach. I was at the beach last week, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was amazing. If you say so. Brilliant. I'm not a beach guy. I don't like beaches. Really? Is it the yeah. same? If no, it's, it's the, I get sunburnt in like four seconds. Oh, so it's too much work to go to a beach and then just find an umbrella to hide in. I might as well <laughs> not have been at the beach. You go like in a, in a what is it, a, a parka or the fully big old- yeah, I'm in all of it. Yeah, I'm uh, absolutely. That's why Washington's a good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love it, love it. What's going on in the world of Atlanta? Other than your brave stink. Beautiful and it's hot here today. Beautiful and hot. What do you consider 80, hot? Nana? 82 degrees. Yeah, it's going to be 90 something before you know it. So yes. <laughs> soon so, enough. Yeah. But it, it seems like 82 is awfully hot for um, April. Yeah, it'll go back. We hit six. We're supposed to hit 61 today. But then it'll heat wave. It'll drop back down into the fifties. Heat wave in the fifties. Oh yeah, we we if, if we actually see sixty one today, that's that's the highest we've seen all year. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Chad, y'all need some more books. Do I? Is one side of the room yours? <coughs> the other side Nita's? Or are those? Just no, those audience? are all me. <laughs> There's just a bench with a window in between. There's even more bookcases you can't see on the other wall. I'm not surprised. <laughs> you see the, can, can you, are those them? Yeah, the pretty looking ones here. Yeah. Those were my dad's. And every day when I was a kid in our living room, he had these gorgeous books and they're like the collection. It's like the 50 books that everyone should read or the 50 classics. I mean, it's like Treasure Island and then there's other books that you've never even heard of and stuff. So my whole life, I always told my mom and my dad that those were mine. Just put them <laughs> in the will. They're mine. I want those books. And when dad passed away, mom, uh, every time we would visit, mom gave me a few more. Every time she came to visit, she brought a few more until I got the whole set. And I love them so much. And The Count of Monte Cristo is my favorite book of all time that on my first ever real estate transaction, I went and found the version The Count of Monte Cristo that goes in the set. And that was my gift to myself for completing my first ever real estate transaction. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. So, yep. These books have been with me for <clears throat> ages. All the way at the end, there's books that I read when I was 10 years old that used to come once a month in the mail. It was called the value series, value of believing, value of imagination, value. And they were like famous people, like the value of courage was Jackie Robinson. The value of honesty was George Washington. And it was all their stories and stuff. And I've carried those. I wanted my daughter to have them. She couldn't care less. But are they, are they uh, illustrated? Yeah, well, they're, they're books, but then there's pictures yeah. to them as well. Um, and then like they always the had like an animal that talked to them. Yes. Yes. They were in yeah, like Jackie library. had his baseball bat, I think was yes. his and, yes. and stuff like that. So yeah, those yeah. used to come in the mail every month when I was a kid. And I, love those. Yeah. I have kept those since I was, my mom destroyed some of them. She used to keep them in her classroom when she was a teacher, but I have <laughs> moved those back and forth with me. My daughter doesn't want them. She doesn't want grandchildren. I have no idea what I'm ever going to do with them, but <laughs> those books just will be with me forever. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So I, before we, we continue the conversation, John Mark, I just want to yeah. warn everybody that's here. If you're here and I don't see you, I'm going to absolutely yell at you and call you out. I mean, there's no reason for a Zoom call to then not have the camera on. I don't care if you're driving. I don't care if you're eating. I don't care if you're whatever. But if your camera's not on, it just means you're not paying attention and you're just pretending that you're here. So turn your damn cameras on. All right, back to you. What were you saying, John? I just got John back, I just oh, got back from a run. So I, I mean, if I can be in the camera, you know, anybody you else can. You're good, you're good. Uh, no, what I was saying is in the library, I used to check the- And I'm walking the dog, the so you'll be That's out okay, of my Debbie. back pocket in a minute. <laughs> okay. You used to check those out at the library, John Mark. Yeah, 
It's a good time. Yeah, I've I've had these. These, my Star Wars toys and my baseball cards. When someone makes me an offer, I'll sell them. But those are things I just I just have had for so long and don't know what to do with them. Love, love it. Let's give it one more minute. We'll get going. Sure. Okay? So for those of you who relate, you missed the fun conversation. You missed me bashing your Atlanta Braves. You you missed the book club conversation of, yes. of some of my books book back here. Uh, but there you go. Some yeah. of you listened. Some of you, oh, some of you logged out. Okay. I know, yeah. right? Seriously. Some of you still haven't turned your cameras on, Lorraine and, and <clears throat> Shelly and Mary and Christina uh leanne wait oh there's another christina christina you're not the only christina right the other christina yeah don't be on a zoom call and then not turn the camera on that's why they do what they're doing i'm on an office computer we'll switch there you go right there you go there you go Bruder's got it okay well let's go and get going to respect everybody's time I um, want to welcome you all to our part one of a three-part series of When Make Give, which is also the name of a podcast with Chad Hines himself and Ben Kenny. Is there, is there another coast? Another host? Bob Stewart is our third, uh, third musketeer. Um, so um, many of you are familiar with Chad. If you're not familiar with Chad, you should be. Uh, Chad has a, been in real estate. I don't know how many years he's been in real estate. 21 years now. 21 years. Uh, he's worked intimately with Ben Kenny, running his team, helping his team. He's back at Washington right now uh, doing a podcast. You're a trainer with the one thing. Um, you've done almost everything. You, he, was, he worked at the region there for a season. So you've done almost everything in the business. So uh, this man right here coached me for a while as well. I have a ton of respect for him and he always brings a ton of value. So um, I'm looking forward to the next hour we're going to spend with him this month. Next month, we'll spend another hour with him. The next month, we'll spend another hour with him. So Chad, I'll give it over to you. Take it away. Thank you very much, John Mark. And hello to everybody in uh, Atlanta. It's good to see all my, my former friendly faces and faces I don't know and faces who I should know and don't know and all that. So I love that your names are here on the screen. Uh, like John, John Mark said, I've been with uh, Keller Williams since 2000. Uh, I've had the opportunity to do every role except MCA. You don't want me to. Um, you'd never get paid. Uh, but otherwise, I've been in every role, every opportunity. And those of you who I know from Atlanta, it's probably <laughs> from my stint as the growth and productivity director of the Southeast region, which was basically a team leaders team leader where I got to travel around, talk to teach, train a lot of you. Um, and then I see other you, others of you from other opportunities. So uh, I'm here, what I do now, yep, I do the podcast. I put the link winmakegive.com if you wanna go find the podcast. You can also just search for pod in podcasts wherever you get them for Win Make Give. There's also another one we do now called the 15 point plan. Uh, that's about health, happiness and balancing your energy feel free to check those podcasts out. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is John Mark challenged me. He said, I want something different. I want something that no other um, market center has had. I want a class that's different from everybody else. I want you to do a three-part series and I want you to call it win, make, give. So uh, today we're going to talk about winning and I'm going to take you through the traits of a winner. There's six traits that we have identified as traits for a winner. We're going to take about an hour. We're going to go through this um, fresh class that we actually even turned into episodes for the podcast for you um, as we were putting this together, as I was putting this together and then we turned it into an opportunity. So hopefully you're also gonna be able to catch there in more depth because here we're gonna take just one hour for the whole thing. There we're gonna do six weeks uh, of, of conversation. There's gonna be closer to 10 to 12 hours of conversation. Yeah, we're gonna talk when, hopefully next week, month you'll join me again. We'll talk make where we'll be talking about how you make more money, how you run your money, things you should be doing with your money. Uh, to help you succeed financially. And then we'll talk about give, uh, which of course is giving back and how you can use that in your business and in your life to grow as a person and so much more in there that John Mark has challenged me to bring to each and every one of you. So as we go through this, I'm going to ask you to use the chat room. I'm really, really good at teaching a class uh, and, and having the chat screen up at the same time. So if you have any questions, feel free to just chat away. Uh, maybe we'll bring you off mute and have a conversation. If not, we'll just 
chat it over there. Or I'll throw the question up. I'll leave some time at the end for some Q&A. But what I want to give you at the beginning, just in case we run out of time, hi, Jenny. If we run out of time is I want to give each and every one of you my information so you can find me after should you desire. So it's chadhimes at gmail.com is my email address. If you don't know how to spell Himes, it's H Yams. I don't eat them. I don't like them. It's just how I spell my last name. It's Himes, but it's H Yams if you're spelling it. So chadhimes at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me anywhere that you want on that. And you can email me at that. So if you want to have any questions that you just don't want to put into the chat because other people might see it, feel free to reach out to me separately. If you want to reach out to me after about something else, just reach out to me separately and I'll be happy to go from there. So let's talk about the traits of a winner. That's what I'm going to take you through today. I'm going to stall for 42 seconds and give Nicole a chance to get back to the computer because she'll cry if I start without her. And then she'll be like, I missed the first one. What was it? Right. And then she'll just bother all of us. So um, no, she's loud of time now. Sorry, Nicole. Okay. So we're going to talk about the traits of a winner and what they mean. And I'm going to take you through, as I said, the six traits. So trait number one, the first trait, and we believe these are in an order, but trait number one is practice. Okay, winners practice. Now, I want to be very clear about something. Practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect. Okay, let me say that again. It's not practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent. If you practice something wrong continuously again and again and again, guess what? You're going to do it wrong all the time. Okay, perfect practice makes perfect. And I want you to remember that as a difference. When you're doing your script plays, when you're doing role play opportunities, when you're practicing writing contracts, whatever it's going to be, you got to practice doing it perfectly. Because if you're not, you're going to end up with those hitches in your swing. You're going to end up with those challenges that you face. I said that on one of our uh, podcast episodes a while ago. And I don't think there's been something that I got more direct messages from people saying, whoa, right? Even Ben Kinney blank looked at me as I said that as we were recording it, and he was like, you know, I don't think I've even heard that one. So remember that folks, practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect. I want to share a quote with you about practice. Unknown was the source of this quote. There is no glory in practice, but without practice, there is no glory. Okay, there is no glory in practice, but without practice, there's no glory, All right? There's nothing glorious, glamorous, exciting about Tom Brady running those plays again and again and again and again and again with his team. And I don't care whether you like him or you don't like him. I'm on, I don't like Tom scale, but it doesn't matter. You got to respect him because he has no glory in practice and practices so hard, so well, so often that he has glory. Okay. Remember that folks, if you're not practicing, you're never going to be the agent you want to be. I was asked this question on Facebook even today. And someone said, can you please jump in and answer what you think about? There is no, it, I don't care if you have natural skill, your natural skill will never take you far enough if you don't practice. Okay. Make sure you're practicing right. What does practice mean? It means to perform an activity or exercise repeatedly or regularly in order to improve one's proficiency. All right, so it's a, to perform an activity or exercise or skill repeatedly or regularly in order to improve or maintain one's proficiency. So I'm going to ask you to dive into the chat window. Those of you who aren't driving at the moment, I'm going to ask you to jump into the chat window for me and tell me one thing you practice on a regular basis. What is something that you practice so that you can improve or at least maintain your proficiency at it? So we've got script and role play, of course. I would imagine that that's going to show up from real estate agents. What are some other things that you're out there practicing? Type it in the chat box for me. Let me know. Practicing doing your DTD2. Okay. Take that. I'll accept that. Practice dry fire. I don't even want to know what dry fire is. That sounds like a very interesting conversation, Jim, right? Practice making calls. Okay. What's something you're not practicing that you know you need to practice? 
right? What's something you need to practice in your world so that you will improve or maintain the proficient level that comes with it? So practice consistency, practice my scripts, right? practice being on time, practice closing, right? practice writing a contract because boy, I write a ton of them for my people nowadays and we keep losing. Right? I got to practice writing these things so I get better and better and better at them. I want you to focus on what are those things. I'm going to share with you top five ways to practice. Okay, I want to make this a practical call. So as I take you through the tactics, I'm going to take you through some tips on how to's to improve in each one because I want you to be a winner. So the first thing to do to practice effectively is set the room. Okay, and I can put quotes around that, set the room. You should be as close to the actual environment as performance will be when practicing. So don't role play with another agent face-to-face -face when most of your stuff's done over the phone. Don't role play over the phone with another agent if it's stuff you're doing face-to-face. You've got to practice that they can't see your facial expression and they don't know you're happy. Or you've got to practice knowing your facial expression because they can see you. All right? You can't practice what homes look like by looking at photos. You've got to practice by going out and previewing homes. Now, today's market, no, that's a little difficult to do. Right? You've got to practice previewing homes. The Seahawks up here in Washington, where I live, the Seahawks are known in the NFL as having probably the loudest stadium that's out there. They have this thing called the 12th man that the, the audience, the fans are almost a player on their team. They're so loud. So what do the Seahawks do while they're practicing? They actually pump music into the stadium at the same decibel. It would sound like if there were fans there so that they're used to it, right? It's practice in the environment that you're going to perform in as much as possible. That's step one. Step two, you've got to eliminate distractions while practicing. Studies that were done, they found that people were not able to maintain focus on practice for more than six minutes without being distracted. Six minutes, which means They'd practice what they were doing. And within six minutes, they were like, oh, let me check Facebook. Oh, let me just stop. This hurts. Oh, let me call my friend and be distracted by something, right? Make sure if you're not using the phone, shut it off while you're in practice mode. Turn off the beeping and the notifications while you're in practice mode. Close windows on your browser if that's what you're practicing something on the computer. Go find a corner in the office or in your house where you're not going to be disturbed so you can practice whatever it is you're doing. One, set the environment, set the room. Two, eliminate all of the distractions. Three, you got to visualize. This is the old quote, you got to see it to believe it, right? See it to be it. If you can't see it, you can't be it. And a study was done with this, which was amazing. They took about 150 people and divided them into three groups. So they had group A, group B, and group C. Group A did nothing. Okay, for practice, they did nothing. They tested them on a baseline. And then they said, come back in 30 days and we're going to do it again. And A, you're not supposed to do anything about this skill. Group B practiced every day they had to practice for a half hour. So they did the baseline test. Then they went and for a half hour every day, they had to practice the skill, practice the skill. Let's put it in baseball analogy. Group A, how many can you hit out of 10 pitches? Okay, now group A, go away for a month. We'll bring you back and we'll find out. Group B, how many can you hit out of 10 pitches? Okay, every day we want you to do a half hour of hitting practice. Group C, and this is the amazing thing, group C, we want to see how many pitches you can hit. Now, we're going to ask you to do a half hour of visualization of hitting the ball every single day. Don't pick up a bat. Just picture in your head hitting that ball for a half hour every day. And in a month, they brought everybody back. 
everybody back. Group A, no change, right? They didn't get any better. They didn't get any worse. They were about the same on their numbers. Group two, group B, they were up 24% improvement. Group C, who did nothing except think about it, was up 23%. So the difference between actually practicing physical and practicing in your head was negligent on the difference. So I don't care if you don't have the opportunity to actually get out there and do what you're supposed to do. You can stop and you can visualize it for 30 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. And if you're consistent about that, you can get the results almost the same as if you went out and practiced doing that activity. Okay, number four, repetition with breaks. This almost comes back to number two in the sense that we have that short attention span. We need to eliminate the distractions. Here, we need to plan and realize you're better off practicing for an hour on, an hour off, and an hour on than you are for two straight hours. Giving your body and your brain that mental break from what you're doing and then coming back to it showed better results than just continuing for two hours. Think about the, the athletes again, who practices more than athletes, right? They practice, they don't practice on nonstop. They practice, they break, they talk, they practice, they break, they talk, they practice, they break, they talk. So you want repetition with breaks. And number five, tip number five for practicing is it's called retrieval practicing. And this is the one you need most, realtors. This is the ability to bring information from memory. It's your scripts. Retrieval practice is the ability to have learned it and then be able to retrieve it when needed. So do you do memory drills for yourself to pull those things up from your memory? Do you do your scripts so much that they are stuck in your head that it's easier to bring them up to memory when you need them? Okay. These are the top five ways to practice. And when you practice, you need to reward yourself. We need to train ourselves to understand that successful practice is rewarded because there's no glory in practice. But with no practice, there's no glory. Right? You teach your puppy a trick, you give him a treat every time while you're teaching him the trick. You're practicing. Your kid does well in school, you take your kid for ice cream. You're practicing, you're helping that kid practice. Oh yeah, you do something well, you get reward. You do something well, you get reward. You gotta remember you folks. What are those rewards and are you giving yourself them when you practice at a high level? So trait number one, practice. If you get nothing from this call, please understand how important that is as what you need to be doing. Trait number two, seek knowledge. Winners seek knowledge. Socrates said, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. The only true wisdom is knowing that you know nothing. Winners know there is no answer at least not a permanent one, it changes. I challenge you to go to a top real estate agent from two years ago and ask them a question about earning listings or ask them a question about getting a buyer's contract accepted. That answer worked two years ago. Does it work today? Not at all. Will it work two years from now what you're answering today? Not at all. The markets will shift. Winners are seeking knowledge and know there is never a permanent answer to most things. There's always more to learn. It's not about the destination. It's the journey when it comes to seeking knowledge. So let me give you the top six ways to seek knowledge. The top six ways of seeking knowledge. Number one, ask. 
ASK stands for always seek knowledge. Hey, that's freaking cool, right? Yeah, I blew Bob Stewart's mind with that one on the podcast when we recorded it and I threw that one at him. Ask means always seek knowledge. Think about a child, terrible twos, right? We, we even named them. You know what's worse than the terrible twos? The fact-finding fours. If you have a four-year-old, you know that if you ever hear the word why, again, you're going to kill somebody, right? Because what do four-year-olds do? Why, 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 why? They just run around questioning everything. What are they doing? They're seeking knowledge. They are a sponge. They are asking questions. Now, they're not asking great questions. Sometimes they're asking absolutely ridiculous questions. Sometimes they're asking questions you have no idea what the answer is. And sometimes you're at wit's end. So what do you do? You say, stop. You say, stop asking me. Right? Well, what are you doing by saying that? You're teaching your kid not to seek knowledge. You're teaching those kids to stop right now. Now, I won't say my answers were always 100% accurate. But I made a commitment when my daughter was born that I would never not answer a question string however long it went. Daddy, why is the sky blue? Well, it's blue because the light refracts upon the atmosphere and the blue is the one that gets through. So that's what we see in blue. What's an atmosphere? Well, an atmosphere, right? I, she would just keep asking and I would do my best to ask. And so finally she went, uh-huh, and then gave up. Right. We need to train our children and sometimes retrain ourselves. The best way to seek knowledge is to ask. You have to be humble to ask. Humble people know they don't know it all, so they'll ask. The second way to seek knowledge is we have to experiment. Right? People do things the way that they've always done things. Why? Because they don't know another way. Experiment and find them. Just think back 18 months ago. I'd be in Atlanta right now. Right? 18 months ago, John Mark would have had me come and do a three-hour class of win, make, give. But he had to experiment and find other ways and say, hey, we could do this Zoom thing. Hey, we could do this. Hey, we can do that. Right? We have to experiment. I mean, think about the fact that Benjamin Franklin experimented with a kite. And that's how we learned about electricity. Think about the fact Louis Pasteur, what did he do? He experimented with bacteria and made milk safe to drink. It's pasteurized. Now you know where the word comes from. It's not the pasture the cows are walking around in, right? It's from Louis, okay? We have to experiment. Are there different ways to do things? When I was a buyer's agent back in 05 in Las Vegas, we had a market similar to what you're going through you still have it easy compared to that market for those who were in business back then. I got sick and tired of showing clients houses. Sick and tired of it. I had one client, we wrote offers every single day for 47 consecutive days before we got a house. I walked up to my rainmaker at the time and said, not doing this anymore. And she said, let's experiment. What would happen? if you treated every buyer like an out-of-state buyer. And I stopped showing houses to people. If somebody wanted to move to Atlanta from Washington, would you still write them offers? Sure. Would they be able to have seen the houses? No. So I taught my buyers why they didn't need to go see every house in the market the way it was. I saved them time, frustration, anxiety, I saved them energy and we just wrote offers like they were out of state people and went to see the houses that counter offered us or accepted our offer. And then we walked in the door to see the house. I experimented to find other days. So experiment with your time, experiment with your money, experiment with sweat equity that you can put into it. Who knows what will come of it for you, for systems, for others, for opportunities to grow. Okay. 
Third way to seek knowledge, change your perspective. Have you ever gone to an art gallery? You don't just stand there and stare at the art from one position. You look at it a little from over here, and then you go over here and you look at it. And then you come here and maybe you go down here to look at it, right? And if it's a sculpture, maybe you even go all the way behind it. How about a tree? You ever look at a gorgeous tree and then you walk around it and it looks like a completely different tree from the other side? You've got to change your perspective if you want to seek knowledge. Learn about it. Look at it in different angles if you literally can. And if you can't, because it's not something that you could look around, just get a different perspective on it. Go ask a new agent. Go ask an experienced agent. Go ask someone selling homes in a different city. Get different perspectives on what might work and might happen. The narrow mind stays rooted in one spot while the broad mind is free to roam. Okay, you'll never hurt yourself by changing a preconceived opinion. So open your mind to what's out there. Next, and this is an easy one, you all should be doing this at a high level, read. You wanna seek knowledge, read. Okay, don't just read, read with purpose though. Just cause it's written down doesn't mean it's gospel. I can give you a list of books that some of you praise and think are the greatest thing ever written that you give me 10 minutes and I will rip that book apart in front of your eyes and show you how it's a piece of crap. On the other hand, there are books that I probably think are amazing and the ultimate source for something. And you'll be like, well, it's proven wrong right here. Just because it's written, not gospel. Read and read multiple opinions on the same topic. Right? Take actions on the readings that you do. Nothing is worse than someone at the end of the year told me they read 52 books because they read a book a week, but they can't tell me more than the title of every book they read or what they did about those books. I'd prefer you read one book 12 times than you read 12 books over the course of the year. And every time you read it each month, you find something new. And it doesn't even have to be books because if you're reading purposefully, you'll find value in magazine articles, in blogs, even in <gasps> the newspaper. There's still value out there if you're reading and seeking knowledge. All right, the opposite of reading, write. Right, reading is great, but it takes an amazing skill to be able to write it in a way that explains it to others. This will help you find gaps of what you still need to learn and seek knowledge when you realize I can't explain it by attempting to write it. And think of the power of writing because how many times have you written yourself a note that you never actually needed the note because you remembered what you wrote on the note? All right, you wrote down pick up groceries or you wrote down your shopping list and then you forgot your shopping list but you came home with 98% of your shopping list. Just by writing it down, you created that action that's helping you seek knowledge and then remember it. Okay, watch. Watch other people. The quote I shared on our episode with this was, life is a show and admission is free. If only you would pay attention. When we don't pay to get into the show, we don't pay as much attention as if we put money down for it. Watch other people. Watch the mistakes they're making. Watch what they're doing to succeed. These are the ways to seek knowledge at a high level and winners seek knowledge. All right, so let's take a deep breath. Okay. So far, I want you to tell me the one thing that you're gonna implement from stuff you've already heard. What are you gonna do differently moving forward from today? Put it in the chat box for me right now. Tell me what you're gonna do differently moving forward just from the first two traits of a winner. And don't just say practice and don't just say seek knowledge, okay? So Nicole's gonna do blind offers and 
treat your people like they're out of town. Ask more questions, eliminate distractions, some visualization training, right? Change your perspective. Read, write, and watch every day, okay? And for those of you who are going to treat your buyers like they're out of town people, I have great scripts that go along with that if you need them, okay? Reach out if I haven't already shared them with you. All right, let's keep going then. Okay, let's keep going and let's go to trait number three. Winners are patiently impatient. Winners are patiently impatient. Now, for those of you who have served in the military, you know that as hurry up and wait. All right, that is the definition of patiently impatient. Hurry up and wait. And that is how the military lives. I've attributed that quote to them. So let's talk about being patiently impatient. There are times to be patient. There are times to be impatient. The first reason to be patient is to gain and show respect to others. So we have to be patient with our clients to gain and show respect. We have to be patient with ourselves, with our children, with our spouses with our leadership, with those that are following us to gain and show respect. I'm taking the time to be patient with you. I'm showing you respect by giving you that time. I'm gaining respect from you by giving you respect. Okay. Time has to be taken to earn results. The other main reason to be patiently impatient is to grow productivity. Because patience builds confidence and patience allows you and others to get better at what you do. None of you are as good when you first wrote an offer as you are at it now. None of you were as good with your for sale by owner scripts, expired calls, open houses, listing presentation as you are now. You've patiently gotten better. Now, most of you are impatient about it. You want a 100% conversion rate immediately. And those are the people no longer in the business. Those of you who have survived have shown patience with it. Okay, so there's things I want you to hear about being patiently impatient. One, competencies such as building relationships, teamwork, collaboration are things that need patience building relationship, teamwork, collaboration, developing others. These are things that need patience. You want results, you want execution, you need impatience. Too much patience will do more harm than good. When in doubt, be impatient unless it's developing a relationship. When in doubt, be impatient unless it's developing a relationship. Because too much patience will do more harm than good for a business. You will miss opportunities, you will miss experiences, and you will miss the chance. Impatience brings results and execution. Okay. Trait number Four, accept responsibility. Winners accept responsibility. Responsibility is accepting that you are the cause and the solution of every problem. Let me say that to you again. Responsibility is accepting that you are the cause and the solution of every problem. Some of you are saying, nope, it's not my problem. I didn't do it. Yeah, you did. Nope, it was my ex-husband's problem. Nope, you married him. Right? Your problem too. Yeah, you don't have to put your hand up. I wasn't even looking at you. Right? I want you to, my clients, they're liars. No, you took them on as clients. Right? 
So here's what I want you to do. Some of you have definitely been in a class where I've done this before. I want you all to point accusationally at me right now at the computer. Point. Like you are mad at me. Oh, that was a good one, right? Je Jeffrey, that was a good one right there in the middle of my screen. You came right at me hard. Do it again and hold it this time, folks. All right. How many of your own fingers are pointing back at you? Ah, oh, crap. Right? Yeah. Three of them are pointing right back at you. So you are three times as responsible as I am for whatever it was you were saying it's my fault. Now, I want you to understand around my house, when I've done something, my wife, Nita, now comes up to me and says, look, buddy, you've got a problem, right? She points all of them my direction. She makes sure I know. I want you to, okay? I want you to understand. And it was funny when we were doing this one, because Ben was trying to like bend his fingers in a way that somehow they pointed all the way back at you again, because they like curved all the way in. No, we are responsible three times as much as those we're blaming because we put ourselves in that situation. So here are four things to do when you accept responsibility. Four things to do. One, own it. Take ownership of your behavior. Admit that you did it. Number two, apologize. Be sincere to anyone you've wronged because of it. I will tell you two of the words that are probably the most used words in my vocabulary are, I'm sorry. I got no problem owning it. And you can be sure at least twice a day, there's something I need to own. Okay. Number three, make it right. Make amends. Do what you need to do. Correct your problem. And then number four, take your medicine. Because you earned it, so now you got to take it. Sometimes that means a night on the sofa, gentlemen. Right? Sometimes that means a loss of a transaction. Sometimes that means a slap hand. Sometimes that means a fine from the MLS. Sometimes that, don't start giving me excuses. Own it, apologize for it, make it right and take your medicine quiet. You earned it, you gotta take it. Which one of those four is the biggest challenge for you? Is it owning it? Is it apologizing for it? Is it making it right? Or is it then taking the medicine that you've earned? Give me a one, two, three, or four in the chat box. Which one is your challenge? <laughs> Noticing a trend in the office, John Mark. All right, noticing a trend. Most people, they're okay owning it maybe and even apologizing for it. They might make it right, but oh, they don't wanna have to sit in it and take the medicine that they deserve, okay? Folks, remember it. Winners accept responsibility. Explain taking the medicine. You don't need me to explain it. The punishment is handed out. Deal with it. Okay. You've got it. All right. Tactic number five. We've got practice. We've got seek knowledge. We've got be patiently impatient. We've got accept responsibility. Wait, am I counting right? Yeah, practice, seek knowledge, patiently impatient, accept responsibility. Five is winners purposefully use their time. Now, if you are Nanette or you are Nicole, you have got to be sick and tired of me talking to you about purposefully using time. But winners purposefully use time. Nothing is a waste of time if you use the experience wisely. How about this? Time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. But once you've lost it, you can never, ever get it back. 
So there are 1,440 minutes in a day. No one on this call has more and no one on this call has less. The question is, how do we purposefully choose to use it? So here's what I want you to imagine. I'm going to hand you $1,440 right now. I'm going to give it to you in tens. I'm going to count it out to you. 10, 20, 30, all the way up to $1,440. You all have $1,440 in your hand. And then I'm going to reach out and I'm going to grab $100 back when you're not looking. And I'm going to take that $100 and I'm going to light it on fire and throw it in my trash bin here. And I'm going to burn 100 of your dollars and I'm going to make you watch that $100 burn. How many of you, by show of hands, would take the $1,340 you have left and throw it into my trash can so it burned with the 100? Yeah, I hope not. Right. I mean, Jenny even made sure she put her hands down at that point. Right. Her hand was on desk. She was like, no way, not my hands. Right. Okay. How many of you would take some of the money and throw it in the trash can and say, well, if you're burning some, I want to burn some. How many of you would take the $1,340 you have left and like clutch it and say, get the hell away from me, Chad. I'm keeping my money. Right. All of you, I would hope. Understand every single day, someone probably comes along and burn some of your money. Some client steals 10 minutes of your day, an hour of your day, two hours of your day, waste your time. You sit in a doctor's office and wait 45 minutes. That's them just burning $45 of your money because each minute's a dollar. That doesn't mean you throw the rest of the money in the trash can. But when someone literally burns your time and wastes your time, you do. You give up the rest of the day and throw all that money in the trash can. So I want to give you four tips to help you manage your time better. You can't manage time, but you can manage your use of time. Tip number one, evaluate the time sucks in your life. What is taking your time? Give me a gut response right now in the chat box. What's something that's just a time suck to you? Email, TV, Facebook, clutter, because my house is a disaster still, right? Some of my friends, oh, wow. Connie and Mary, congratulations for stepping up and saying that right? Good for you to have the courage to type that in. And if any of you are friends with them, they didn't mean you, right? They meant their other friends, just so you know. Okay. Folks, figure, Deborah, delete that damn thing off your phone right now. Just do it right now. Show us, right? Let's see you delete that app. What I want you to understand, folks, is you are wasting time on social media because you're not purposeful when you get there. You don't set a timer that said, hey, Siri, give me five minutes on a timer. Okay. Go away, right? Siri just popped up on my computer. And now you sit there and you go do your thing. Five minutes. Shush, right? What I want you to do, I got to cancel a timer. Hang on, it's going to beep at us in like five minutes here. What I want you to do is I want you to do things like that so that when you start doing social media, you don't stay there and let it become a time suck. What about watching live television? Oh my gosh, why do we watch live TV at all? I can watch an hour program in 42 minutes if I don't watch it on live TV. Commercials aren't there for good. Well, who needs commercials? Skip them. Stream things, right? Number two, to better manage your use of time. Eat that frog. Now, if you don't know that concept, it's a fantastic book, okay? Brian Tracy calls Eat That Frog. And what he talks about, I'll sum the whole book up for you. There you go. Okay. What he does is he says, if you woke up today and the ugliest bullfrog was put in front of you and you had to eat it, would you eat it first and get it out of the way? Or would you wait all day long still knowing you have to eat it? And I don't know about you, but the longer I left it, the bigger it would seem to be. The uglier it would seem to be. The worse it would seem to be. Eat that frog, 
get things out of the way that need to be out of the way. What is your number one priority every day? John Mark, forgive me. It's not always lead generation, folks. Right? It's not always lead gen. It might be many days. But if that's not your priority that day, make sure you know what your priority is every single day. Okay. Number three, use your communication skills. You have them, use them. Type less. Use less words. Literally, take less time writing that 17-page email. Or just pick up the phone and save time in the first place. Because you're probably wasting a lot of time back and forth with emails, avoiding picking up a phone because you just don't want to have the conversation. I could have just typed this out and sent it all to you and saved us all an hour. You wouldn't have read it. You won't remember it. You wouldn't do anything about it because you don't have the interaction and the emotion that came with it. But I could have just typed this whole thing up and sent it to John Mark and said, here you go. Share this with your people. Have a nice day. Okay, but use your communication skills. Okay, and number four, put you time on the calendar, folks. The biggest complaint I hear from people is I don't have any me time. That's because you don't put it on there. You have to take care of yourself. You have to have self-care. You have to feed your soul. And if it's not on your calendar, you never get it done until it's too late. And that's when burnout happens. Evaluate your time sucks. Eat that frog. Use your communication skills and put you on the calendar. Now, Nicole, uh, Nanette typed it earlier. She said, oh, he's going to do the calendar thing again. No, I'm not going to get into the calendar with all of you guys now. That's a whole class on its own, right? But I will give you the order of operations for a calendar quickly, okay? John Mark, again, forgive me. Keller Williams has been lying to everybody here for years because the first thing Keller Williams tells you to put on your calendar is lead generation, and that's not the answer. Okay, and I promise you this. I've been with Keller Williams for 21 years. I bleed red, okay? The first thing that goes on your calendar each and every day is bedtime. Because you have to start with the end in mind. And if you don't know when the day is going to end, you're just going to keep going all day long. You have to know the day will end at this time for you. And here's the amazing thing. You get to choose that time. To me, it's eight o'clock. To you, it might be midnight. Don't care. Second thing that has to go on our calendar every single day, well, it's the opposite. We got to wake up. We got to know when we're getting things going. We got to make sure we get enough sleep. So if I know I'm going to bed at 10 o'clock and I know I need eight hours of sleep, my wake-up time can't be earlier than 6 a.m. If that doesn't work because I got to get someone somewhere, then I got to make adjustments and I got to go to bed earlier so I can get up earlier. Third thing that goes on a calendar when we build our calendar are uncontrollable commitments uncontrollable commitments. Those are things you've already committed to that you can't control. You wanted to attend today's class. Well, you can't have it at three o'clock. It was at two. You couldn't have it at 10 this morning because that worked for you. It was at two. That's an uncontrollable commitment. I got to lock that in on my calendar. I want to be there for this. I set this appointment with a client already. I have a doctor's appointment at this time. I must pick my child up from school at this time. I have tickets to the Braves game at this time and I am going and they won't move the game for me. Those are uncontrollable commitments. Then the fourth thing that goes on our calendar, our priorities. Now lead generation is hopefully a priority to you. Lead follow-up is hopefully a priority to you. You time time with your family, time to work on your health. These are all hopefully priorities. Now you get to fit these in where they go. And there are fifth and sixth things that go on our calendar. They don't need to be talked about today. So your bedtime, your wake up time, your uncontrollable commitments, and then your priorities. Don't start with lead generation and thinking your world revolves around it because you'll skip it to make everything else fit. Put it where there actually is time for you to do it because it's a priority to you. Okay, so let me recap, and you'll realize I've only done five. Practice was number one. Number two, seek knowledge. 
Number three, be patiently impatient. Number four, accept responsibility. And number five, purposefully use time. The sixth thing that winners do is they seek mastery. And Leonardo da Vinci said, one can have no smaller or greater mastery than mastery of oneself. One can have no smaller or greater mastery than mastery of oneself. And if you are practicing purposefully, if you are seeking knowledge each and every opportunity you get, if you are being patiently impatient the right ways at the right time, if you accept responsibility, and if you purposefully use your time, you will then have found mastery that you're seeking. And those are the six traits of a winner and how you can apply them to your life. So I want you to take 30 seconds. I want you to look at your notes. I want you to take emotion out of it. Not something that went, oh, to you or anything like that. But I want each and every one of you to type in the chat box, what's one thing that you will implement slash do different slash change slash make happen within the next 30 days. So that when I come back for make and ask the question of what have you done over the last 30 days, you can actually come back to this and say, Chad, I'm a winner. And here's what I've done from those traits you shared and the lessons that came along. So folks, Anita is going to add up a bedtime. So if there's somebody here who talks to Anita on a regular basis, find out what her bedtime is and then find out she's keeping to it. Right? Following a calendar, putting a bedtime on my calendar. I'm going to go read Eat That Frog. Yeah, it doesn't take long to read. Okay. Practicing saying no. Mm, it's a good one, Jim. Right. Here's what I'll say about saying no. Every time you say yes, you've said no to thousands of things you don't see. You've said no to being here. You've said no to being with your family. You've said no to being whatever it is. So understand that saying yes means saying no. You just don't see the things you're saying no to at the moment. Okay. Now, Nanette, that should be something that you should have been doing every day since we were doing that and you stopped doing it clearly if what you're telling me is figure out your priority each day. I've taught Nanette in the past, folks, you should wake up in the morning and you should brain dump what you could do that day. Everything. Then you should go take your shower or go have your coffee or go do your workout or go do something, drive to the office. And then when you get there, pull that list back out and put it in order of priority. Because winners focus on their priority. Could have been the next trait, but winners focus on their priority. And I want you to understand that just because you can check things off a list doesn't mean you're doing well. Just means you're doing things. See, and that's when coaching with me, I, I kick you in the pants about that. Right? I keep you on that. I hold you accountable to that, to your calendar, to the other things. That's why I love what I get to do. Okay, visualize, evaluate my time sucks, reward myself. That's a whole bunch of things you're going to do. Just do one at a time. You're better off actually doing one thing for the next month than doing four or five things that came from today in the next month because you'll do none of them really. People with one to two goals achieve one to two goals. People with three to six goals achieve zero to one goals. And people with seven or more goals achieve zero on average. Having more goals does not mean you have more chance to achieve them. It means you have more things pulling you in different directions to achieve none of them. Pick one thing that you're going to do. If you want to find me, I'm at chadhimes at gmail.com.
H yams, how you spell it. You don't remember that? You miss that? Go ask Nanette, go ask John Mark, go ask Jim. They all know how to get a hold of me. Find me on Facebook if we're not already friends. I'll help you there. I'm going to tell you, here's what I recommend. Go to winmakegive.com. That's the website. It'll take you right to the podcast. Yesterday, we dropped episode one of the six traits of a winner. On Friday, we're going to interview an Olympic gold medal sitting volleyball Paralympic player. She's going to talk about practice from an athlete's mindset. And we're going to take you through the six traits where we talk for 40 minutes at least, the three of us, and then finish every week on Friday with an interview with somebody who uses that trait in their profession. You're going to hear a lot more about the traits of a winner, but today was giving you that surface view and enough for you to go implement and make something happen. So my calendar says I've got three minutes as I purposefully use time. So John, Mark, key your mic up to something you want to share, something you want to say. And gang, I'm here. Ask questions. You got something you want to type in the chat box? You want to know something? Even if it's got nothing to do with this, I'm here to help as I purposely use my time. Love it, love it. Uh, yeah, guys, um, if you have any questions for Chad, like you said, we got about three minutes left. If you have any questions you want to ask him, um, do, do, do uh, plug into the podcast. It's phenomenal. I listen to it. So uh, uh, when make give, uh, he put the link at the very top. Make sure you, you get, uh, uh, jump into that. Any questions anybody has about uh, anything we went over today or just in life? Okay, that was easy. You did it. Third that means one of two Third things. Row. I've either completely overwhelmed them and they're all sitting there going, oh my God, he put so much in my head. I don't even know what to ask. Or they're saying, I am embarrassed to ask my question in front of other people. <laughs> okay, those are the times to go email chadheims at gmail.com or find me and message me on Facebook, Chad Himes. I'll answer them for you so that you don't have to worry about me calling you out in front of everybody. But I don't know, John Mark, I don't have my calendar in front of me. Do you? Uh, hey, Nick. <laughs> yep. There you go. Nick's got your calendar in front of him. Nick, when are we back for making? We are on May 11th, I believe. Okay. If he says it's May 11th, then it's May 11th. It is Tuesday, May 11th at 2 p.m. And then we're June 8th at 2 p.m. All right. May 11th and June 8th. Write those things down. Join me for make. We're going to talk about money. That's what make will clearly be about making more and doing the most with your money. And then the third one, give. And we'll be talking about how you can give, where you can give and how that comes back to you. And we'll talk a lot more about that as we get there. So until then, check out Win Make Give wherever you get your podcasts or winmakegive.com. You can join our Facebook group, find the group Win Make Give. Come on and join the group where we have conversation. And now you know how to find me. If you have any questions or challenges, you want to bounce my way, I am here to see how I can help. Good deal. Thank you so much, Chad. It's amazing as usual. So we'll see you next month. All right, gang. Have a good one. Chad, good to see you.